While we're all waiting for James Webb to launch, which it will, the extremely large telescope to be constructed and LUVAR to get approved, please get approved, please get approved, we're all gonna need a way to pass the time. So let's have our imaginations take flight out into the universe and consider some of the most incredible ideas suggested for telescopes. Unless you've been crawling through scientific journals like me, I guarantee you've never heard of any of them. But when I'm done, you're going to want to fund all of them. Okay, let's get into it and start talking about an idea that you're probably familiar with, but put it on the moon, the overwhelmingly large telescope moon edition. People always ask me why nobody is planning to build a telescope on the moon. And obviously, that's because getting to the moon is incredibly hazardous, complicated and expensive. The best effort of the United States was to get 12 men down to the surface, and they were able to bring home a few hundred kilograms of space rocks. But what if we had a serious presence on the moon, with SpaceX starships flitting back and forth between our worlds, and someone wanted to put up a serious telescope on the moon? What's possible? Okay, fine. Here's what's possible, according to Gene Schneider, Joseph Silk, and Farouk Vakili, called OWL Moon, very high resolution spectropolarimetric interferometry and imaging from the moon. First, a little background. The largest ground telescope under construction is the European Extremely Large Telescope, which will measure 39 meters across, more than triple the size of the largest operational telescope right now. And when it's completed in 2026, the ELT will have the capability of directly observing planets orbiting other stars. But there was another idea in the works called the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope, which would aim to build the largest possible Earth-based telescope with an aperture of 100 meters across. This telescope would have the capability of studying the atmospheres of Earth-sized planets orbiting other stars. But when the cost estimates reached more than a billion dollars, a billion dollars, Europe decided to build the extremely large telescope instead. Nobody wants to put a billion dollars into a telescope. Yes, I'm aware of James Webb's budget. So the plan for Al Moon is to put the overwhelmingly large telescope on the moon. What could you do with a telescope that big in a place that has no atmosphere? Al Moon could directly observe Earth-sized worlds orbiting other stars and map out their continents. It could study the atmospheres of other worlds and search for biosignatures with a high degree of precision. It could, get this, watch the silhouettes of planets as they transit in front of their stars and measure the heights of their mountains. It could look at planets and detect the glint of light off their oceans. And then, of course, you could use it for anything else you'd want to study with a 100 meter space telescope, newly forming planetary systems, the accretion disks around black holes, and peer right out to the very edge of the observable universe and see the first stars forming. For all you David Kipping fans, Owl Moon could serve as a detector for a telescope, using the atmosphere of the Earth as another lens to see the universe with even more precision. There's another advantage. By having a telescope on the moon and other telescopes here on Earth, you can have them act together as a single telescope with a baseline of 380,000 kilometers on average. Now, it's not as good as a telescope that big, but with modern techniques and a lot of computing power, it could be possible to resolve the surface of the pulsar at the heart of the Crab Nebula or see the surface of White Dwarf Sirius B. The challenge of building a gigantic telescope on the moon, of course, is building a gigantic telescope on the moon. Right now, it costs about $100,000 per kilogram to launch material to the moon. So clearly, a lot of it would need to be built out of local materials, which is abundant on the moon. But engineers would need to develop optical surfaces that don't require polishing and could be 3D printed right on site. Europe is already planning a lunar village, which could begin construction in the 2035 to 2050 timeframe. Antarctica is another place that's remote, complicated, and difficult for humans to survive. But once there were permanently inhabited research stations at the South Pole, the telescope soon followed. When the lunar village gets set up, we could see smaller 1 to 8 meter telescopes followed eventually by the monster lunar scopes. Next up, let's consider the Nautilus proposed by Daniel Apai, Tom Milster, and others called a thousand Earths, a very large aperture ultralight space telescope array for atmospheric biosignature surveys. Man, I like every part of that title. Their goal is to create a space telescope capable of finding life on other worlds. 
an observatory that can scan the atmospheres of 1,000 Earth-like worlds in the habitable zones of their stars within a radius of 1,000 light years. Considering the fact that there are new observatories today that can do this, even James Webb or Louvoir won't be able to scan exoplanet atmospheres at this industrial scale. It's going to take an enormous space telescope. But instead of a single expensive space telescope, Nautilus would consist of 35 14 meter wide spherical telescopes. Each one of these instruments would be more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope, but they use a special kind of lens that's perfect for studying the atmosphere of a transiting exoplanet, but not great for general astronomy purposes. The lens is called a multi-order diffractive engineered material lens technology, or MODE. They're lighter and less dense than traditional telescope mirrors and work through diffraction as light changes directions. Best example of something like this is a Fresnel lens, which is flat but can still provide magnification. The telescopes would be constructed on the ground and then stacked up inside their rocket in a compact configuration that fits within a rocket fairing. 15 Nautilus units could be stacked up inside a SpaceX Starship launch fairing like a roll of coins. Then they'd launch to their ideal orbit, probably the Earth-Sun L2 Lagrange point, you know, that spot that keeps the Sun, Earth, and Moon in the same spot in the sky. The telescopes would deploy and inflate into spheres with these unique mode lenses. And here's the key. They don't need to fly in a specific careful formation. They don't even need to be close together. They can drift closer and farther from each other it really doesn't matter. They're not using interferometry to combine their light. They're just collecting the light that falls on their separate instruments, merging that together as if it was a single telescope with the total surface area of all the separate lenses. They'd act like a single telescope, the equivalent of a 50 meter space telescope. This would be one to two orders of magnitude more powerful than Louvoir at a reasonable price. And they could be scaled up, just launch more space balloons. I'll put a link to the original paper in the show notes so that you can read it at your leisure. It goes into great detail and there's some math, but it's highly readable and I think you'll enjoy it. Two telescopes down, but I promise you a third. How about a telescope that's more than 100 kilometers across? And we'll get to that in a second, but first I'd like to thank Sergeant Frizen, Phil Kurjan, Josh Susser, and the rest of our 827 patrons for their generous support. Educational content should be freely available to anyone in the world, and the patrons make this possible. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today and get in on the action. The French astronomer Antoine Labéry has been advocating for decades for the plan of building a hypertelescope, a gigantic space telescope made of smaller individual observatories that fly in formation. Consider the Event Horizon Telescope, which used the technique of interferometry to create a virtual radio telescope the size of planet Earth, and captured images of the event horizons around various black holes like M87. If you can separate the telescopes but still align the receivers to the point that they're observing the same photon wave fronts, you can have a telescope the size of the Earth. This is called interferometry, and allows you to resolve objects that you wouldn't normally see. You can't see faint objects as well, but the resolution is really helpful for bright objects. Interferometry in radio waves is tricky, but possible here on Earth as long as you've got your clocks perfectly calibrated and you've got an enormous amount of computer power. Interferometry in the infrared and visible spectrum is much trickier because the wavelength of the photons are so small. The European Southern Observatory's very large telescope is an interferometer, using the combined light and baseline from four separate telescopes to act like a single telescope, but it does it with a lot of lasers. But what if you could fly your separate telescope in space, where you could align them perfectly to do interferometry without atmospheric turbulence, wind, weather, wildlife, and earthquakes? Bayry proposes a flotilla of tiny optical telescopes just a few centimeters across and arrange them into a gigantic sphere which then communicates to a larger focal combiner to receive the signals and send them home to Earth. In a proposal to NASA in 2008, the team suggested a starting size of one kilometer, which would be made up of 100 light collectors, each of which is 25 centimeters across or about 10 inches. At this point, it would have the same ability as Hubble to see fainter objects, but with much higher resolution. But follow-on missions could expand the number of spacecraft in the array to over a thousand, as well as expand the wavelengths farther into the infrared and ultraviolet. 
If the sphere provided a 100 kilometer diameter, they would be capable of providing images of the surface of an exoplanet 10 light years away from Earth. Astronomers would be able to separate the oceans and continents and even see different vegetation zones. And they've proposed a version that would be more than 100,000 kilometers across that could image the surface of neutron stars, see the region around the Milky Way's supermassive black hole in unprecedented detail. It would directly image the first galaxies that formed in the universe. It could detect rogue planets and black holes as they pass in front of stars, in front of other galaxies. One advantage of this strategy is that you can start small. The technique would be viable with just 12 collectors and a focal combiner spacecraft. But then you could launch more collectors and more focal combiners, creating larger and larger telescopes. The array would be launched to the Sun-Earth L2 Lagrange point. Now, because the light pressure from the sun will be constantly pushing on the lightweight telescopes, they would actually be positioned a little closer to the sun so that then they'd be in balance. Micro thrusters might be needed to keep them aligned, and if they run out of fuel, then you just send more collectors. If they get knocked out by cosmic rays or micrometeorites, you send more collectors. They're cheap and easy to replace. But an even bolder idea is to use lasers to keep the telescopes aligned. An infrared laser could push the collectors around and then trap them in a parabola with an accuracy of about one micron. Of all the ideas in this video, the hypertelescope is actually the farthest along. Liberi and his team are working on a ground-based version in the southern French Alps. It's built into a valley with dozens of collector mirrors focusing their light on a focal camera that's suspended above. And if these tests are successful, we could see prototype versions fly next. New technologies, lower launch costs, reusable rockets, the next, next generation of enormous space telescopes could be right around the corner. What do you think? Which of these three telescope ideas do you like the best? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Here are the names of the patrons who support us at the $10 level and more. Want to see your name here and support the work we do? Go to patreon.com slash universe today. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and I send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story, and links so you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. Did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus materials like interviews with me show up right on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Interested in the next generation of super telescopes? Here's a video that we did first on all of the ground super telescopes and then all the space super telescopes. Watch it now.